recording. Just check again. Yes, we're recording. OK, so uh, this lecture is about these wonderful pieces of, uh, of glassware called uh, viscometers. There's the YouTube or Oswald viscometer. And then you have this uh, variant of that called the extended YouTube or extended Oswald uh, viscometer. And uh, in this lecture tutorial, we're going to show you how these simple but beautiful pieces of instrumentation can tell us a remarkable detail about the properties of biomolecules in solution that are relevant to industry. Viscosity is such an important parameter. And we heard this, uh, was it last week or the week before, we heard from uh, the uh, guys from industry, Nick Darton, AstraZeneca, Bernardo from Santa Fe, uh, Jan Yezak, Aracor, uh, not so much Tejas because he was talking about regulatory things, but from the other three, we found the importance of viscosity in one particular application, which is the uh, uh, the delivery of monoclonal antibody solutions at high concentration to patients in the treatment of inflammation, cancers, and other things. That's just one example of how uh, viscosity is important uh, in the biopharma, but also in the, the food industries, because viscosity is a very important functional uh, parameter. It's important in, as well because it reflects the molecular properties of a molecule in terms primarily of its uh, conformation, whether the molecule is a blob or whether it's extended or whether it's a Y-shaped antibody molecule. It's generally a very sensitive function to, uh, to shape. And uh, for some classes of molecule, those that are not spherical, it's also a sensitive measure of the, uh, the size of a particle. So it's an important technique that you need to know uh, for understanding you know, the characterization of large molecules, particularly in the, the biopharma and the food industries. And you were introduced to this last uh, semester in lectures from uh, Gleb. I think it was Gleb, yeah, but not from uh, not from me. So what I've done is I've put a some slides up on the the Moodle. Not long, only about half an hour ago. So you probably haven't seen this uh, yet, but they're on the research tutorials part of the uh, industrial placement uh, module. So what I've got to do now is somehow see if those slides are here. And they are not. So we've got to go to uh, this. And uh, see if the, this is it. So it's such a simple method to make. It's not like you're not expensive in any way, not like X-ray crystallography anymore and things, but it can tell you it's a, a remarkable amount of important information about these molecules. Right, let's just see if we can uh, bring this up. Right, so let's just uh, come out of that. And go back in again. Right. Can you see that, folks? There should be a picture of. Yeah, I can see it. Famous scientist. Oh, okay, yeah. Done, yeah, Gleb did some of this last uh, semester. He he pinched it familiarly. I I get. I used to give these lectures on viscosity for many many years, but uh, I think he's already spoken about. Uh, Einstein's involvement with the 
uh, viscosity uh, technique. So it'll do no harm in uh, in just going back to his involvement. Let's just get, let's just show this on full screen mode. Uh, let's go to uh, where are we? Blah 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 blah. Right, you got that on full screen mode, folks. Yeah. So there you go. There's our YouTube our Oswald viscometer, uh, which has this capillary in it. And this is the extended Oswald viscometer, which has got this extended capillary in, uh, which gives a better resolution. What you're doing basically is measuring, you put liquid into here. This is a coloured solution, so it might be haemoglobin, it might be cytochrome C, it might be myoglobin, I'm not too sure. And then you basically pump the liquid through this capillary and then pass this mark here and then through this little uh, reservoir bulb here and then pass this top mark with a pump and then you stop pumping and then the liquid basically relaxes back it drops back very slowly very slowly because it's got to pass through this capillary here and the liquid will go from this mark to this mark. You time how long it takes to get from there to there. And how long it takes for the liquid to get from there to there depends on how viscous, how resistant to flow the liquid is. And what you do is you measure that time it takes to get from there to there. Then you compare it for your protein solution or polysaccharide solution or DNA solution, and you compare it with the time it takes to get from there to there for just solvent without protein in there. And from that comparison, and if you do take certain precautions so that the temperature is equilibrated and you know what concentration that you're working with and you correct for complications like those uh, non-ideal effects we mentioned last semester, you can get valuable information about the uh, sizes and shapes of, uh, of macromolecules very quickly, particularly those of importance in uh, bio, bio pharma. And Einstein's involvement was he worked out the theory of the viscosity of solutions of spherical molecules uh, back in 1906 uh, with a correction in 1911. I think Gleb mentioned this. Did Gleb mention the mistake that Einstein made? In his... I believe he did, but I don't actually remember uh, it. So, but I do remember him talking about a mistake. Paper in 1906, which published his calculation, Einia Bestimmung der Molecular Dimensionen, uh, a new measurement or new determination of molecular dimensions, and uh, mentions how the use of uh, a technique known as uh, or the, the flow properties, uh, observing the flow properties, flusikaiten, of biological molecules. You can get, uh, in principle, an idea of the molecular dimensions of a molecule. And uh, he published a relation uh, which allowed you to work out the uh, dimensions from uh, viscosity measurements. And then there was a mistake that was found uh, a few years later in Einstein's calculation. People were getting wrong results from his derivation. People trying to get uh, or calculate Avogadro's number from the Einstein derivation and getting values which were uh, up to 250% out. So uh, that caused uh, one of his uh, colleagues who was her cop, so her Baslin, one of his colleagues in Zurich, had uh, found that things were going things weren't quite quite right and then uh, Helen Hopf was the one who checked 
Rechnungen, Nachzuprüfen, check through uh, meine Rechnungen, Nachzuprüfen, check through my calculations, and I found in their Tat eine Rechenfeller, and found uh, in the calculation a Rechenfeller, an error, a calculation error, der das Result hat erheblich falsch, which gave false results. Uh, diese Fälle will ich im Folgenden berichtigen. These mistakes will I in the following uh, report uh, correct. So the, the lab made a mistake, Einstein made a mistake of 250%. This uh, viscosity parameter, which he calculated to be 1, should have been 2.5. So even Einstein, one of the greatest minds that have ever lived, was able to make a mistake, and a big mistake. Uh, of 250 percent. He basically missed out a whole series of calculate a uh, series of terms in a calculation, one of his energy calculations, uh, which gave rise to the error. Now was corrected in his paper in 1911. zu meiner Arbeit. Correction to my uh, my work. Eine neue Bestimmung der molecular dimension. A new measurement of molecular dimensions. From Albert Einstein. Right, so why was Einstein and, and a lot of other uh, major scientists uh, involved in developing the theory of uh, viscometry? The measure of flow of solutions through uh, instruments like the Oswald viscometer. Well, it provides a simple, straightforward technique for measuring the uh, solution conformations of molecules, and also an idea of how water or solvent interacts uh, with them. It can accept for, it doesn't work for spherical molecules, but for other types of molecules, we can get information about the molecular weights of biomolecules, and also the flexibility, how bendy or flexible uh, molecules are, which are very important uh, functional uh, parameters. And there are uh, various types of viscometer. We've just shown you the uh, Oswald or the Oswald YouTube viscometer. There's a variation of the Oswald viscometer called the Uberloader uh, viscometer, which has uh, an extra uh, arm or reservoir arm uh, coming off here. But the conventional form is a U-tube, Oswald, which uh, the liquid is placed in this reservoir here and then is pumped through this narrow capillary into this uh, bulb shape here and then past this uh, top mark. And then when it's got past this top mark, the pumping is stopped and the liquid relaxes under gravity very slowly because the capillary restricts the flow to, to slow. And it will go from this mark, and you time how long it takes to get from this mark to this mark. Could take about 60 seconds or so, maybe longer than that, depending on how viscous the solution uh, of molecules uh, is. So that's the principles of the Oswald uh, viscometer. Right, it's uh, right, but then the another one is the cone and plate viscometer, whereby you don't have a, a glass uh, tube, but you have basically uh, this construction here. So you have an inner cylinder which is at rest. And then you have a rotating outer cylinder, which rotates at a speed controlled by a drive, this construction here. And then your solution or sample goes in between the two cylinders. And if it's viscous, then it requires more force. If the liquid between the inner fixed cylinder and the outer rotating cylinder is more viscous, then it will take more force to make the outer cylinder 
uh, rotate. And that force is recorded or tension is recorded on this uh, torsion wire attached to the inner uh, cylinder. And that torsion or force depends on the viscosity. So it's another way of measuring viscosity. This is called a rolling ball viscometer. So this time you have a capillary and you can't see it. Well, maybe you can see it. There's a little, ball, a little steel ball here. And what happens is the, the steel ball starts off at the top and you put your liquid, your, vis, your liquid in there. And then uh, it goes in this holder, which uh, incubates the temperature very accurately because viscosity is a very sensitive function of temperature. So it needs incubating very accurately. And it goes in this uh, receiving arm. And then you can change the angle of the arm because the, 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 the higher the angle, the faster the ball will fall through. But for a given angle, the ball will fall at a rate which depends on the uh, viscosity of the solution. So you're measuring the flow time it takes to get from there to there. So it's very similar to the YouTube viscometer. So instead of watching a liquid flow through, you're watching a steel ball flow through the liquid. So that's the rolling ball uh, viscometer. But the most popular is the, the YouTube. You can see this YouTube viscometer here. And it's sitting in a temperature bath. When we make our measurements, we've got to make sure that the temperature is controlled very precisely and preferably to one hundredth of a degree. Because the viscosity of a solution is very sensitive to the, the temperature of the liquid. So you have to control the temperature during the, during the measurements. And when you do the practical, you'll be working on this type of system. Here's our solution. Again, it's a red solution that so could be hemoglobin or probably not myoglobin. That's a bit too bright for myoglobin or maybe cytochrome C. And then you have a tube here. And the, the, another tube here containing the reservoir. So liquids pumped through here, through the capillary here. And then passed this sensors here, these set of sensors here, through this bulb, and then past this top set of sensors. And these are photosensors, photodiodes. So you've got an automatic pumping system, uh, which is controlled by this box here. And then when the liquid gets beyond this sensor, the sensor triggers the pump to stop, and then it will start timing. It'll start timing how long it takes to get from there to there. And this is done automatically on this, this timer device. So that's how we measure viscosity at constant temperature with a viscosity uh, viscometer system. Quite close by viscometers, you often find density meters. These are devices measuring the densities of solutions and samples. And that's because the uh, viscosity equation uh, will involve a term containing the density of the solution and the solvent. So it's always important to have a density meter, it's called, close by the uh, viscometer. Right, don't worry about this. This is this is sort of uh, uh, this is the th theory that Gleb gave you last semester. You don't have to reproduce this. This is just to show you where the uh, viscosity equation comes from. And uh, viscosity is a measure of the resistance to flow. And it's basically the ratio of the shear stress, which is this Greek symbol tor. And tor is simply the force applied by the force changes per unit area. So this surface here is stationary, so it could be the wall of the capillary wall of one of those glass viscometers, or it could be the stationary cylinder in the cuvette uh, viscometer. And then as you move away from the stationary surface, the glass wall or the, uh, the stationary plate, then the viscosity of the fluid flowing will get faster and faster the further away you get from 
the, uh, the stationary plate. So these lines here represent the relative rates of flow of liquid as a function of distance uh, y or delta y from the stationary uh, surface. So the viscosity is defined as the force applied per unit cross-sectional area. Uh, so it's a force applied per unit cross-sectional area divided by the what's called the uh, the shear rate, which is how the velocity changes with distance from the uh, the stationary uh, surface, the glass wall, the capillary, or the stationary cylinder with the uh, cuvette rotating types of viscometers. So dvdy is how the velocity, so by these arrows here, changes with distance delta y. And this viscosity at 20 degrees centigrade for pure water is 0.01 poise, where poise is the unit of uh, viscosity in these units. These units are, when we talk about these last semester, the centimeters gram second system of uh, units. So the viscosity of water is 0.01 poise. And you don't need to know this. We don't need to know about these units poise uh, really, because these units will cancel out. And the reason is what we're interested in is not so much the viscosity of a solution, but in how much the viscosity of the solution or caused by the solution particles uh, increases the viscosity compared with pure solvent. Now, a dissolved macromolecule will increase the viscosity of a solution because it disrupts the smooth flow of the fluid. And it causes the macromolecule to uh, rotate in response to this uh, concentration, this uh, velocity gradient in the uh, viscometer. This causes the molecule to rotate and disrupt the smooth streamlines of the flow. And we define the relative viscosity, its Greek symbol eta, or subgroup R, as the ratio of the viscosity of the solution containing the macromolecule. So your solution of Fab antibody or your solution of whole intact antibody molecule or uh, your solution of a valvamin or some uh, dimerizing this uh, a dimeric uh, nucleic acid binding protein or something. So it's the, the relative viscosity is the ratio of the viscosity of a solution containing the macromolecule of interest, which is the symbol, not, this is not N, this is the Greek symbol eta, so that's of the pure solvent in the absence of the macromolecule. So that's just pure solvent, which could be water, phosphate chloride buffer, or, or something else. And the relative viscosity is the viscosity divided by the viscosity of pure solvent in the absence of the macromolecule. And this is called the relative viscosity. Eta subscript R is the relative viscosity. So that's what we're mainly interested in. And you can measure the relative viscosity as the ratio of the flow time of the solution divided by the flow time of pure solvent. It could be water, it could be sodium chloride solution, it could be anything really. Times the density of the solution divided by the density of the, the solvent. So you need to know what the density of the solution and solvent is 
as well as the flow time of the solution and the flow time of the solvent. And it has no units because the units of viscosity cancel out and the units of time uh, will cancel out. Right, finally, we, we have this other viscosity parameter called the reduced viscosity. Uh, because relative viscosity depends also on the concentration of the molecule, as well as the shape and volume. So if we're going to use viscosity to infer on the shape and volume of the macromolecule, we need to eliminate or account for the concentration contribution. And the first step in this pathway is to define the reduced viscosity, which is the relative viscosity minus one divided by the concentration. So the reduced viscosity is the relative viscosity minus one divided by the concentration. So this, if you like, compensates for the fact that viscosity is a function of concentration. So we can allow for this concentration dependence by defining this uh, reduced viscosity. So the relative viscosity minus one, and this value will be greater than zero because the viscosity of a solution is always greater than the viscosity of the solvent, divided by the concentration. And if the concentration is measured in grams per mil or grams per centimeter cubed, the units of reduced viscosity are the units of that, which is no units, divided by the units of concentration, which are gram per mil. So if that's in gram per mil, the units of the reduced viscosity is mils per gram, which is one over gram per mil. And the final thing we've got to do is to correct for, remember this from semester one, non-ideality effects, which derive from exclusion volume, backflow and charge effects, non-ideality effects. And just like we did with the osmotic pressure and sedimentation, we get around this, this problem by either working at very low concentration or by making measurements at a series of concentrations and extrapolating the result back to zero concentration. But these non-ideality effects tend to zero. And straight away, so this value extrapolated to zero is called the intrinsic viscosity, which has a symbol eta with these two square brackets around it. So this is a very important parameter in biopharma, the intrinsic viscosity. And you can see how different it is for proteins compared to polysaccharides. Proteins, globular ones anyway, have a relatively small Intrinsic viscosity between three and five mils per gram, whereas polysaccharide DNA and glycoconjugate molecules, because they're linear molecules, great capacity to trap and entrain water, uh, they have very, very large reduced viscosities and hence very large intrinsic viscosities after corrections have been made and extrapolated back to uh, zero. Uh, concentration. And there are two forms of this extrapolation which we uh, can do. One is called the Huggins equation. It's like this. So you just plot the reduced viscosity and extrapolate back to zero concentration to give you the uh, Intrinsic viscosity, eta, the square brackets around it. So that's this extrapolation here. This is for uh, a polysaccharide called alginate, very high uh, intrinsic viscosity. Or you can use this equation called a Kramer equation, log. The relative viscosity divided by concentration equals the intrinsic viscosity times one minus kk, uh, the intrinsic viscosity times concentration. 
so uh, this is the Kramer equation here. And this is the Huggins equation. And both equations lead to the intrinsic viscosity as these lines go to uh, zero. OK, so at zero concentration, uh, then uh, the reduced viscosity and the inherent viscosity uh, equals the uh, reduced, the, the, sorry, intrinsic viscosity. So that's how we get the intrinsic viscosity from measurement of uh, viscosity. By making measurements of intrinsic viscosity as a function of concentration, extrapolating back to zero concentration using the Huggins equation, or doing something similar uh, with the uh, the Kramer equation. And we do both usually to check for consistency, check we haven't made a mistake with the Huggins or Kramer uh, equations. That's how we correct for concentration effects or these non ideality effects I've spoken about before. Right, a variant of the Huggins equation is this one here, uh, where this is the uh, viscosity concentration dependence uh, parameter. But another one is called the solomon sciuta equation, whereby it combines the Huggins equation, which predicts a, a positive slope, with the Kramer equation, which picks a negative slope. And the idea is that if we make this measurement at a series of concentrations, uh, we can convert the the uh, Huggins equation together with the Kramer equation to give this. It's called the solomon sciuta equation, and it basically is a fusion of the Huggins and the Kramer uh, line fits. And if we use this, the intrinsic viscosity can be calculated approximately as one over the concentration times twice the intrinsic, the relative viscosity minus one, minus twice the log of the uh, inherent uh, viscosity eta r to the power a half. So it's the square root of all, all this. That's how we get the intrinsic uh, viscosity. Mm. Right, let's assume we found intrinsic viscosity. What can we do with it? So we measure intrinsic viscosity. Uh, and we know it depends on the shape and flexibility and degree of water binding. Let's see how, how it does vary with these uh, parameters. And also for non-spherical particles, let's see how the intrinsic viscosity varies with molecular weight and how we can get molecular weight information from it. Right, this is the first slide showing a comparison of the intrinsic viscosity for spherical type or globular types of macromolecule of different uh, sizes, ranging from a simple glucose molecule of, so that means molecular weight here, so that, that's been lined up incorrectly, folks, sorry. Uh, molecular weight 180 and the intrinsic viscosity is 3.8, so that's good. Alge, by contrast, is huge. It's of 2,000, the size of a uh, 200,000. Uh, sorry, let's just let's go back on that. This is it. The, what's plotted, what, what, what we're showing here, all right, is the table of molecules of different sizes. And this lot here are all globular particles. And this lot here are not globular particles, but rods or coils. What we're trying to show here is that 
irrespective of the molecular weight of these uh, molecules, ranging from glucose, molecular weight 180, through to tomato bushy stunt virus of uh, molecular weight 10.7 million, the intrinsic viscosities are more or less all the same. Whereas for linear types of molecules or extended molecules like alginate, myosin and fibrinogen, uh, these values are much tougher. OK. So globular particles and uh, rod and coil shaped molecules which have higher intrinsic viscosities, which depend on the uh, molecular weight, uh, flexibility, and degree of solvation of the molecules. That's why alginate, although it's got a lower molecular weight than myosin, has a much higher intrinsic viscosity. Sorry, this, this needs lining up correctly. Up to 700 mils per gram. Uh, because of its much greater water binding uh, capacity, which greatly increases the uh, viscosity. So the intrinsic viscosity so found depends on the shape, flexibility, and as I said, degree of water binding. Uh, and this water binding, don't forget, is time average. It's a dynamic process, but we measure the time average amount of water that is bound to the molecule over a period of time. And also the intrinsic viscosity for non spherical particles will depend on the molecular weight. We've just seen that, right. So now we're going to look at the effects on the shape and hydration, or how the intrinsic viscosity relates to protein shape and hydration. And this relation between shape, this function here, which looks like a B, but it's a Greek symbol nu, N nu, Greek symbol nu, the shape function, times Vs, which is the swollen specific volume or the volume of a molecule swollen through water binding or hydration uh, in solution divided by the uh, mass of the anhydrous volume. We call this the swollen specific volume, which we met in semester one, and its units are mils uh, per gram. It depends on the amount of water interacted with the, the protein. For spheres, Nu is the Einstein value of 2.5 for rigid spheres, not the value given by Einstein originally before uh, Herr Hopf had calculated, had, had corrected his calculations. So this shape factor nu, or the Einstein value, has a value of 2.5 for rigid spheres and is greater than 2.5 for other molecular shapes. Vs, the uh, swollen volume or volume of the hydrated molecule per unit and hydrous mass is given by this equation here. Vs is the partial specific volume, V bar, which we've been talking about, plus delta, which is the hydration or the amount of uh, water, which is bound per gram of uh, protein. And uh, rho naught is the density of the solvent. That Vs equals V bar plus delta over rho naught, and that equals V bar SW, where SW represents the uh, swelling of the, the macromolecule. And once again, V bar is the partial specific volume, the volume of the anhydrous volume per unit uh, anhydrous mass. So anhydrous volume per unit anhydrous mass of the particle. This value is 0.73 approximately per proteins and about 0.6 for carbohydrates, polysaccharides. So that, the, those are the equations for getting shape out. 
And the three forms of this equation. There's the first form we've just shown, intrinsic viscosity is nu times Vs, the swollen specific volume. Or another way of writing it is nu times, and in brackets, V bar plus delta over rho naught. And the final way is intrinsic viscosity equals nu times V bar times partial specific. So it's the shape factor nu times the partial slope volume B bar times the swelling factor or swelling ratio SW. And these are typical values for proteins and for uh, polysaccharides. Right, so shape, simple shape uh, for globular particles, we can get uh, from these ellipsoidal shapes. Some of the uh, rugby ball or prolate ellipsoid, and then the flat M&M &M or smarty shape, uh, disc shaped molecule called oblate ellipsoids. And this is how the axial ratio, so you, sorry, the viscosity increment, nu, changes with axial ratio, the ratio of the long axis to the short axis, depending on whether it's a prolate ellipsoid or an oblate ellipsoid. You can see it's a much more sensitive function of shape if it's a prolate rather than an oblate ellipsoid. That's the application of ellipsoid uh, models. Or we can use uh, B models. We mentioned this in the, uh, the lecture on solution properties of antibody molecules, you might uh, remember. And we represent the molecule as a series of spheres. We calculate the intrinsic viscosity and other properties, such as the sedimentation coefficient, which we mentioned in the antibody lecture, using a program known as SOLPRO, uh, which comes from uh, this uh, chap, Professor García de Torre, at Mercia in Spain. And there's a reference here you can look at, uh, which links to uh, Garcia Latora's early references on the uh, Solpro uh, program. So you can, can, the idea is you create a model and you calculate what the intrinsic viscosity, sedimentation coefficient and other parameters are based on the program uh, Solpro. And then you compare that with the experimentally determined values. And then you find the difference. So you just uh, adjust, refine, iterate the model until the calculated and experimental values agree. And then when you get a match, then you've got uh, a possible confirmation of the uh, of the molecule, we have the antibody molecule, IgE. But you have to be wary there could be other models which have an equally good fit to the experimental data, and we call this the uniqueness problem, which we talked about in the antibody lecture. And the way around that is to use more than one parameter. So instead of using intrinsic viscosity, we use sedimentation coefficient. We could use the, the radius of gyration, which we get from X-ray scattering uh, as well. And there's also, we can use uh, NMR data uh, in addition to that. And by combining these different methods together, and if they all predict the same model, then you can be reasonably confident that your model is uh, correct. But for other classes of molecule, such as uh, rod shaped molecules or extended random coil molecules like glycoconjugate vaccines, DNA, many polysaccharides, then uh, we have to represent confirmation in a slightly different way. And we use what's called a how triangle. So we place 
This is the corners of a triangle, the three extremes of macromolecular conformation. Sphere, rod, and random coil. And the idea is, sorry, I'm having a copy here, is that the conformation of any given molecule lies between these <coughs> extremes. Now, sphere, coil, or rod. So long this, these, these extremes, these lines separating these extremes, represents a given macromolecule. So, for example, a protein molecule, a regular shaped protein molecule, will have a shape between the extremes of rigid rod and sphere, probably ellipsoids and probably prolate ellipsoid types of shapes. Whereas a polysaccharide would generally have a conformation between a rigid rod conformation and a random coil conformation. And a denatured protein will have a conformation something between a sphere and a random coil. This is the Haug triangle. We read this before, last term when we started talking about the uh, properties of molecules. And the Haug triangle came from this uh, scientist in, uh, in Norway. And each extreme of conformation, sphere, rod or coil, has a characteristic relation linking intrinsic viscosity with molecular weight. So intrinsic viscosity equals a constant times molecular weight to the power A. And A is known as the Mark Howing Kuhn Saccharada coefficient. This looks rather silly having uh, lots of names on an equation and the reason why it's called this is because uh, multiple scientists made the same uh, discovery in fact four of them did from different parts of the world at the same time there was mark in austria who came up with this relation linking the intrinsic viscosity with uh, molecular weight then uh, howing in I think the Netherlands was doing the same thing at the same time that was published very close to Mark's paper so it became known as the Mark Howing equation but then uh, Kuhn in Switzerland I think or Austria, yeah, Switzerland uh, also obtained the same equation so it became known as the Mark Howing Kuhn equation then after the Second World War it became apparent there was someone in Japan who been working on the same thing and came up with the same equation called Saccharada. So that meant it became known as the Mark Howing Kuhn Saccharada equation. And uh, similar relations exist between the sedimentation coefficient and the molecular weight. The diffusion coefficient, which we'll meet next uh, Wednesday when we start the uh, the uh, tutorials D or the uh, BIOS 4005 uh, module, which is part of research tutorials, which, which form research tutorials B. And also the rate of duration, which we, we, we get from light scattering, is also relates to molecular weight in these power law relations where. Intrinsic viscosity equals a constant times molecular weight to the power A. The sedimentation coefficient, correct at standard conditions, equals another constant times molecular weight to the power B. Diffusion coefficient equals another constant times molecular weight to the power minus epsilon. We'll explain that next week why it's got minus epsilon. It sounds a bit strange, but there's a reason for that. And the duration radius from light scattering equals another constant, K prime, 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 times molecular weight to the power C. So if you measure the how an intrinsic viscosity changes molecular weight, or S with molecular weight, or D with molecular weight, or RG with molecular weight, from the slope of a logarithmic plot of 
in terms of viscosity against molecular weight, of sedimentation coefficient against molecular weight, of diffusion coefficient with molecular weight, or the duration radius as a function of molecular weight, the slope of these plots will be a measure of the uh, conformation and flexibility of the, the molecule. And we're focusing on the intrinsic viscosity here, which equals a constant times molecular weight to the power A. You can find out what A is, you can get an idea of the type of molecular conformation you have. So for a sphere, A is zero. That means that the uh, molecular weight doesn't, doesn't depend at all. Sorry, the uh, intrinsic viscosity doesn't depend at all on the uh, molecular uh, on the molecular weight. So the slope of a plot of log intrinsic viscosity as log molecular weight uh, will be zero. So further value for the Mark Harring Kuhn Sakurada coefficient A is zero. That means you have a compact sphere conformation. It was between 0.5 and 0.8. That corresponds to a random coil shape conformation with complete flexibility. And if it's a very rigid rod type of molecule, you can get values right up to 1.8 for the Mark Haring Kuhn Sakurada coefficient. So this is a measure of the, the conformation of the, the molecule. This will tell us what sort of molecular conformation we have sphere, coil, or rod shape conformation. So for the proteins, A is approximately zero, and for polysaccharides, A is usually between 0.5 and 1.3, particularly the flexible ones. The intrinsic viscosity is also ideal for monitoring conformation change. So you want to check whether your protein is denatured or not, you just measure the intrinsic viscosity. You can use another technique, the circular dichroism, which uh, Mary Phillips Jones will be talking about next week. And uh, George has already met Mary, right, George? Yeah, sorry, I had some reminders in front of my unmute button. But yeah, I've met Mary before, she's really nice. Yes, yeah, she's really nice. So she'll be teaching us next week. Uh, and she'll be other things on the uh, uh, the BIOS 4005 or 4152, which is part of the you know which is part of uh, the uh, research projects module. So we we'll we're meeting Mary next Wednesday. So you can use CD, circular like dichroism, which is used heavily in industry as a measure of conformation in solution, or just simple intrinsic viscosity measurements using the cheap viscometer. And in the uh, practical, which you'll be doing in May, you'll be measuring the uh, viscosity of a uh, biopharma related parameter. So you'll be estimating the intrinsic viscosity and following its change as you uh, denature that uh, protein uh, molecule. Well, it won't quite follow this pattern here. So you're going from a Low intrinsic viscosity corresponding to a sphere. And then when you get beyond 40 degrees, see how the viscosity increases, the intrinsic viscosity. And this corresponds to denaturation of the protein. And by the time you get to 50 degrees, all the protein has denatured. So it's a good check in industry if your protein is uh, properly folded or not. Or you could use circuit dichroism as well for that check. And the third, I've only finished now, but it's worth saying that intrinsic viscosity is also ideal for monitoring the uh, stability of uh, macromolecular preparation, especially for drugs. Uh, so uh, we take a, this is a polysaccharide known as chitosan which comes from the shells of crabs and lobsters. It's a byproduct of the seafood uh, industry. And uh, these are long uh, sugar type molecules with lots of positive charges on them. So the 
poly electrolytes. They're very high, highly positively charged. And these molecules are used in nasal drug delivery because of the positive charges. They tend to interact with the negatively charged uh, mucus, mucins lining the, uh, well, the lining the elementary tract and other areas of the body too, but in particular the, the nasal uh, the nasal site, you've got the uh, mucus epithelia protecting, so protecting mucus layer, protecting the epithelia below. And uh, chylosome will interact with this. And uh, chylosome, uh, which is used in the drug delivery in this way, uh, can be stored in different temperatures. And what the uh, manufacturers of this were interested in, and this is a company uh, which uh, is now called Upperton, uh, Upperton Limited uh, at the uh, Highfield Science Park in Nottingham. But here they were interested in looking at the, the stability of these chylosan preparations to see if they were stored at uh, different temperatures in which the uh, molecular integrity would uh, would remain and they found that at 40 degrees centigrade that the uh, viscosity or the reduced viscosity which is uh, measured at a particular concentration uh, the reduced viscosity of uh, this chitosan material dropped uh, dramatically over a period of a few weeks so it's very quick degradation in the first two weeks with the uh, reduced viscosity dropping by over a half. And then it plateaus off. Uh, at 25 degrees centigrade, you get a much reduced degradation, but it's still significant. But at 40 degrees centigrade, we get a much slower rate of degradation. So if you were making a cutazan based drug and you were uh, exporting it to overseas, then you if it was going to say Saudi Arabia or to Italy or Japan or a hot climate, then you recommend that the, uh, the formulations would be stored at low temperature, four degrees centigrade to minimize this type of degradation. So this is an example of viscosity being used as a quick and easy method to monitor for stability of molecular preparations. And then finally, let's show you this. This is the famous experiment conducted here at Nottingham in the uh, 1940s. Can you all see me still or not? Can you, or can you just see, just see a big screen or can you see me in a little box holding up a viscometer? You're in a, a small little box underneath a big screen. So you can, don't, don't, don't maximize it. You can still see, see this little viscometer in the uh, small <laughs> box. <laughs> right. Then using this type of viscometer and also this type, this is the extended, extended capillary viscometer, which gives a uh, greater resolution between the flow times of the solution, the time it takes to get from there to there, compared to the solvent from there to there. Uh, so using these simple viscometers with temperature properly controlled to within 0 0.01 degrees centigrade, this is what Creeth and colleagues, these are his supervisors, Gulland found back in 1947. So DNA generally has a very high viscosity, a very high relative viscosity. Relative viscosity is viscosity of a solution of DNA compared to the, uh, the viscosity of uh, pure solvent. So the ratio of the uh, viscosity of the solution of DNA, the viscosity of the solvent, measured by uh, flow time uh, measurements.
So uh, one and two uh, two solutions of highly purified car thymus DNA with very high uh, viscosities. And what happens is th this was what we find at normal pHs. So around neutral uh, seven uh, up to just over 11 mils uh, per gram. George, you still okay? We'll be finished in about five minutes. Yeah, no, I'm still, I'm still fine. This, it's like half past. Okay, we'll be definitely we'll finished by then. Uh, and this is the viscosity of another solution. Again, very, very high. But notice when we increase the pH to very high alkaline conditions, the viscosity drops dramatically. And you get identical drop in uh, viscosity uh, if you go the uh, other way. So if you go to very high acid conditions, you can see how the viscosity, relative viscosity drops uh, dramatically. And what's happening here is that the high acid or high alkali conditions is uh, breaking the bonds which keep the DNA chains together. It basically confirms the presence of hydrogen bonds which hold the DNA chains uh, together. Now it wasn't sure then whether there were two, three or four chains, uh, but whatever was happening, the uh, addition of acid, high acid conditions or alkali, high alkali conditions was uh, disrupting the hydrogen bonds. It was titrating out the, the, hydro, the hydrogen bonds in the DNA molecule, causing the chains to come uh, apart. And this was the paper that was published in uh, 1947 in the Journal of Chemical Society. Uh, now, Kreeth, this is Kreeth. He was the uh, PhD student. It was only about, uh, how old was he then? 1947, he was about 23 then. But then how that compares to you guys, folks. Uh, but he was 23 when he did these experiments, 24. Uh, no, no, 23, yeah, 1947, 23. And this was done in the uh, Trent Building at University Park. Uh, the Trent Building used to be where the chemistry department used to be uh, many uh, years uh, ago. And a few years ago, we held a meeting to mark the, the 70th anniversary of the discovery, well, in 2016 and the, and the publication in 1947, 70 years after that, that was 2017, to mark the anniversary of this uh, discovery. And in November 2017, we had this big meeting uh, held here. Uh, I mean, Creed that died in 2010, so he was not able to come, but it was attended by uh, his family and then many leading researchers in uh, DNA. Right, so that's a very interesting application of the uh, viscosity technique all those years ago. It played a crucial part in uh, showing the hydrogen bonds. And in fact, Creeth himself, he produced his own model for the DNA uh, structure, uh, which I think I referred to this after the and we did the uh, the James Watson, Michael, uh, Michael Crick film, the very first thing we did when you started your course. I mentioned the uh, Creeth experiments and also his model for DNA, uh, which had uh, two chains linked together by these uh, hydrogen bonds. Uh, but what was missing was the uh, the helix because the X-ray data of Rosalind Franklin uh, wasn't uh, available then. And of course, he didn't know then 
uh, which base is linked to uh, which that wasn't known <coughs> at that time. Nonetheless, it was a major step in the uh, ultimate discovery of the structure of the DNA molecule, which was finalized by Watson and Crick some years uh, later. But this work proved uh, crucial to the, uh, the hydrogen bond binding work to the eventual discovery of the, uh, the double helix structure by uh, Watson and uh, Crick. This is something that Nottingham can be, uh, can be proud of. OK, there's some references there which you can follow up on. Uh, I've also. I'll just get these off in it. It's outside. On the uh, Moodle, I'll also put, I'll better put the lights on folks, so you can't see. OK. This is my office, by the way, if you haven't seen it before. Uh, now, it's nice now coming back into the office. Now, uh, you know, the vaccine is having a big effect in terms of bringing down the uh, COVID rates and things. And I have my vaccine, it's three and a half weeks ago now, so I should have uh, quite decent immunity. So uh, I don't know if you can see that, folks, but this is uh, a paper we published uh, which appeared in 2018 on the uh, discovery of the hydrogen bonds in DNA. So I'll add this to the reference list on the, the Moodle. And uh, inside the paper, OK, there's, can you all see that, folks? Yeah. yeah. OK, so you see the two chains? That's just outside my office now, the, that the, the model, alongside the Watson Crick model. But there's breaks in the chain. That's the Crick model. So it wasn't quite accurate. And what's also missing is the, uh, the double helix. But nonetheless, it doesn't look that too different from the, the Watson Crick model, which came out some uh, years later. And then when we come and do the practical, which is uh, in the uh, lab, next to uh, my office. I think we were here when we did the spectrophotometer demonstrations not long ago. Uh, you'll get a chance to uh, see the models uh, and uh, use these types of viscometer. Right, so uh, the next thing is to just get out of that and to uh, Research tutorials, research tutorials A. Oh, that's your answers. Research tutorials A. Oh, come on. I'm just trying to get the uh, timetable and questions. Right, I'll just change screen so you can see that. And then you can ask questions to me when we've done that. Uh, let's get that up. So if I just cancel that one and then load up the uh, Word file, which is that. OK, guys, can you all see that? Yes, Steve. Yes. Yeah. OK. So uh, next week, we'll go through this question on the ligomeric structure using the uh, analytical ultra centrifuge. So we'll, we'll go through that next week. So Kesha, hopefully by the, when you've got yourself sorted out, you'll be able to send that through. Uh, and if you need some clues, just let, let us know and we'll be able to, uh, uh, to help you while you're doing that. But we're giving you another question to do as well. And uh, that's question two. So question two is in three parts. What you have to do is comment, first of all, on the Albert Einstein value of one. 
uh, for the viscosity shape factor for a spherical solid particle. Is this value correct? If not, indicate what the correct value should be. Well, that should be very easy to answer. You should be able to get that uh, straight away. And then you have to just indicate what the intrinsic viscosity is, what it's meant by it. So the relative viscosity and the uh, reduced viscosity, and how you extrapolate that back to zero concentration uh, using the Huggins or the, uh, the Kramer methods. And then approximate values expect for proteins, a few mil per gram, and the nature proteins, six, seven, eight mil per gram. And then uh, you're given some data, and like here, you've got to plot a graph. So you need to use uh, the equation linking, you need to work out what the uh, reduced viscosity of the molecule is at these different concentrations. Reduced viscosity equals the flow time of the solution at a given concentration divided by the flow time of the solvent times the density of the solution divided by the density of the, uh, the, 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 the solvent. So you need to work out what that is for the four concentrations. What's the which concentration corresponds to the pure solvent? I think one. Well, the, the first entry, that's right, which is zero mg per mil. So this corresponds to the solvent. OK, so to get the relative viscosity, you can't do it at zero. You've got it's about 0 0.4. 6.9, 8.4, to get the relative viscosity of 4.2 mg per mil, you've got to take the flow time of the solution and take an average of these readings and divide by the flow time of the solvent and take an average of those readings times the density of the solution divided by density of the, uh, the solvent. So it's that, average of that divided by average of that times 1.0011. And here it's the average of that divided by the average of that times 1.0019. And here is the average of that, okay, divided by the average of that times 1.0023 to give you the uh, viscosity, the reduced viscosity at 8.4 uh, meg per mil. And then what you've got to do then is plot the concentration for your three points, 4, 6.9, 4.2, 6.9, 8.4, along the x-axis, and then the reduced viscosity along the y-axis. OK, and then you should be able to get the uh, intrinsic viscosity from plotting the points, fitting a straight line, and extrapolating back to uh, zero concentration to get the intrinsic viscosity. And that should tell you what sort of state this protein called norwadine is that's been subject to pasteurization. That means uh, heating at a temperature of 60 degrees centigrade. So that might have denatured the protein, but let's see uh, what uh, denaturation, what those temperatures have done, whether it does denature uh, or not. So that's what you gotta do. You've got to answer this question about Einstein with two marks, and then explain what intrinsic viscosity is and how it relates to the reduced viscosity and you've got to extrapolate back to zero concentration for three marks and then for 10 marks to plot a graph of uh, concentration well first we've got to complete this table so 
before 6.98.4, you need to work out what the uh, flow time of the solvent of the so flow time of the solution is the average of these values, the average of those values, average of those values, and in each case divide by the flow time of the, the solvent to get the relative viscosity. And then you convert that to the uh, you know, with, with the, when you're measuring the flow time ratios, you've got to correct also for density as well. So the density correction 1.011 for 4.2 mmol, 1.019 for 6.9, 1.023 .9, or 8.4 mg per mil. Okay, and then do the plot of reduced viscosity versus concentration, and then uh, extrapolate back to zero concentration to get the intrinsic viscosity and then comment on the confirmation of uh, nobody. So I suggest you have all the go this week and then let me know if you run into any problems, but that should be a good one, uh, a good one to do that will teach you all about intrinsic viscosity of uh, molecules that you need to know. Right, guys. So, uh, any questions on that? I'm all good. Thank you very much, Steve. Okay. No doubt you'll be finding problems when you do attempt that. Yeah. So, sure I'll find problems me. while I'm doing it, but yeah. at the moment, I've got no questions. Thank you. Okay. Kesha, if you can try and do both this week. But. Uh, if you can't, then try and complete the uh, molecular weight and oligomeric structure uh, question, if you can. OK. Kesha? You've lost her. I'll, I'll, Kesha, if you still hear me, I'll, I'll check that you've got that message. And uh, it's on the recording anyway, so we've got that, uh, that, 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 that covered. So while you're doing these questions and are stuck, just play back the bit at the end where I'm, 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 I'm talking through the, well, this, in this case, question uh, question two. Uh, that should help you uh, answer the question when you come to uh, these particular ones. Fab, fabulous, uh, probably better. Since we're dealing with an antibody course, fab means something uh, something else. Any questions before we go? Thank I'm you, Steve. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. I'm fine. Thank you very much. Right. Kesha, are you there? I think she dropped a, a message on the chat box. OK, we'll make sure she gets the uh, the question. Uh, I'll drop her. A, I'll drop her a note. Great. All right, guys. See you next weekend. And uh, I'm really looking forward to these projects getting going now. Sounds like we made some really good progress with all of you. Um, you. I think all Thank three of you are worried to go and catch you too from what I, what I understand. Yeah. Thanks, yeah, Steve. Everything's ready to go now. OK. And, uh, you know, well done all three of you in getting and getting sorted three absolutely excellent projects here. Uh, Judith and I are very, very pleased, very proud of you. Okay, right. Guys, I'll see you. Have a nice weekend. Okay, right. bye. Bye. See you, Steve. Bye bye. Bye, Steve. I'll just stop recording. Thank mm -hmm. you.